Dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitors are used in diabetes type 2. Dipeptidyl peptidase is a key enzyme that determines the clearance of glucagon-like peptide 1. DPP4 inhibitors prevent the gradation of GLP-1, and by this they enhance the insulinotropic effects. The major reason why we use DPP inhibitors is to improve metabolic control in patients with diabetes type 2. In simple words, we use DPP inhibitors to lower blood glucose level, and the glucose lowering effect we control by a reduction in glycated hemoglobin. So, knowing this, let's illustrate the mechanism of action. So, here we have pancreatic beta cell. Beta cells have GLUT1 transporter. This transporter provides transportation of glucose into the cell. Also, they have ATP sensitive potassium channels. And we have to know that in rest state, potassium channels are opened. So, because potassium is intracellular iron, which means that the concentration of potassium inside the cell is much higher than the concentration of potassium outside the cell, while potassium channels are opened, potassium constantly leaves cell. Also, beta cells have voltage-gated calcium channels, and in rest state, calcium channels are closed. So, calcium, which is extracellular iron, in rest state, cannot enter into the cell. Also, beta cells have intracellular vesicles, and intracellular vesicles have already formed insulin and C-peptide. When glucose enters into the beta cell, glucose undergoes phosphorylation by glucokinase to glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate undergoes glycolysis with subsequent degradation in Krebs cycle and electron transfer chain that results in production of ATP molecules. ATP molecules activate ATP-sensitive potassium channels. With activation, potassium channels close. If potassium channels close, potassium begin to accumulate inside the cell. With increase in positively charged potassium ions, membrane potential increase. For example, from minus 70, membrane potential increase to minus 50. And the state when membrane potential becomes more positive, we call depolarization. And depolarization triggers activation of voltage-gated calcium channels. If calcium channels open, calcium by concentration gradient begin to enter into the cell. And increasing intracellular calcium triggers exocytosis of vesicle, with release of insulin and C-peptide into the blood. The fate of C-peptide is rather prosaic. C-peptide incomes to the kidneys, and kidneys excrete C-peptide from the organism into the urine. Insulin in the blood stimulates tissues to consume more glucose. And because glucose begins to income to the tissues, glucose level in the blood decreases. In addition to this, beta cells have GLP-1 receptor, which provides regulation of insulin secretion. Glucagon-like peptide 1 in the blood binds to GLP-1 receptor. With binding, receptor becomes activated. Activation of GLP-1 receptor stimulates closing of potassium channels and opening of calcium channels. As a result, more calcium molecules income to the cell, and with increasing intracellular calcium level, exocytosis of insulin increase. Interesting that the amount of glucagon-like peptide in the blood is controlled by a specific enzyme called dipeptidyl peptidase 4. This enzyme provides inactivation of glucagon-like peptide. In simple words, DPP-4 destroys GLP-1 molecules. If we prescribe DPP inhibitors, they inactivate DPP enzyme. With an activation of DPP, the destruction of GLP-1 molecules decreases. As a result, the amount of GLP-1 molecules in the blood will increase. With increase in GLP-1 molecules, the activation of GLP-1 receptors increase. 
this potentiates the effect of GLP-1 molecules and cause increase in intracellular calcium. And the higher the amount of intracellular calcium, the more active becomes the exocytosis of insulin. So the release of insulin and C peptide into the blood will increase. Increasing concentration of insulin in the blood stimulates tissues to consume more glucose, and thereby this will cause decrease in blood glucose level. And this glucose lowering effect is exactly the reason why we use DPP inhibitors. In addition to this, the excretion of C peptide increase. It's important because by excretion of C peptide, we can monitor how much insulin B cells secrete into the blood. So, the major effect of DPP inhibitors is by increasing GLP-1 to cause increase in insulin secretion. This will increase insulin sensitivity of tissues, which will cause increase in glucose uptake. But in addition to the major insulinotropic effect, DPP inhibitors also cause minor effects, which are related to increasing concentration of GLP-1 in the blood. DPP inhibitors cause decrease in glucagon secretion that results in decrease in glucose production. They decrease appetite that cause weight loss, and also they delay gastric emptying that decrease the severity of postprandial hyperglycemia. The major benefits of DPP inhibitors is that they are highly orally available, they are well tolerated and easy to use medications. They do not require titration, which is very good for physician, and they can be taken at any time of the day without regard to meal, which is good for patient. One of the major benefits of DPP inhibitors is that they can be combined with other anti-diabetic agents. We can use them in combination with metformin, we can use them in combination with HGLT2 inhibitors, and we can use them with insulin itself. But the major benefit of this drug is safety in case of overdose. DPP inhibitors usually cause full inhibition of DPP enzyme, which means that any increase in exposure to drug in case of accidental overdose or due to the reduced clearance in case of renal disease will have no additional effect. So the risk of hypoglycemia on DPP inhibitors is very low. This feature is very useful in treatment of elderly patients. Usually they are frail, vulnerable, and usually they intake a lot of other drugs. In this case, DPP inhibitors are a good choice, because they are safe and they do not cause overdose if patient accidentally will intake them two or three times. And they are good in patients with renal disease, simply because in renal disease drug clearance is disrupted, so substances tend to accumulate. And as we know, DPP inhibitors, even at high concentrations, will not cause hypoglycemia. So, the most common category of patients that intake DPP inhibitors are elderly patients, usually older than 75, who have a history of comorbidities. Previously, it was suggested that DPP inhibitors can cause increase in risk of acute pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. But novel clinical trials do not show this tendency. Overall, these drugs are very safe. They do not increase the risk of hypoglycemia, and they do not cause weight gain, which is very important in treatment of diabetes type 2. But nowadays, all these positive aspects of DPP inhibitors are offset by absence of any significant effect on cardiovascular system. Because nowadays, we have drugs that can decrease blood glucose level and simultaneously improve cardiovascular functions this drug class called HGLT2 inhibitors. DPP inhibitors we still use in patients that take many drugs due to the multiple comorbidities. According to recent guidelines, the first choice in treatment of diabetes type 2 and atherosclerosis are GLP-1 receptor agonists or HGLT2 inhibitors. For patients with diabetes and heart failure, 
the drug of choice are SGLT2 inhibitors. And only as a third line drugs we use DPP inhibitors. And important that we use them in combination with metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors. So, DPP inhibitors are safe glucose lowering agents, but they are not as potent as HGLT2 inhibitors or GLP1 receptor agonists. And because of this, we use DPP inhibitors in combinations with other more potent agents.